Good evening, and we are glad you're tuned in to see television. Welcome to this edition of the Big Debate. We are coming to you live from our studios, Plot 59B, Naguru Road, Tinder 2 Road. And tonight it is the Big Debate. I am your host, Heston Munanura. Well, the IMF and the World Bank came out to tell the whole world that there is an impending recession, economic world recession. But in this topsy-turvy economy, we see that Uganda's public debt has hit a record of 80 trillion Uganda shillings. The question tonight is, is Uganda's debt burden sustainable in these current economic times? Well, to discuss, but before we get into the discussion, I'd like to apologize that one of our guests, Honorable uh, Anthony Akol, who I couldn't make it, just got a slight encumbrance, an accident while coming on uh, to the studio. And uh, uh, he sent his apologies. But, you know, the show must go on. We are having a Miss Penina Mbabazi, who is from Siatini, a policy analyst on debt and aid, who is going to take us through the top, this very topic tonight. Well, Miss Penina, welcome to the big debate. Thank you. Happy to be here. Yes, um, before we get down to the nitty-gritty of uh, the, the topic tonight, uh, what did you make of the presidential address, uh, the State of the Nation address by the president, where he talked about you know, Ebola and the pandemic? And notable among, he said, uh, tourists can come, the nation is safe, so they shouldn't shun the country, and Ebola is being contained. Um, my reaction uh, to uh, the president's address, mainly I feel that there is a better way that they, we could have handled it, um, given that uh, we as a country took a bit of a gap in, uh, in kind of um, at going straight to how to address the issue. And uh, even now, while they did a lot of border control and have tried to limit um, access to these districts that have been affected. There is still a lot of movement. There is still a lot of crossing. Um, we have seen public uh, people still come in public spaces even beyond the numbers that can be controlled. And um, that still sets a message apart from what um, we received from him. So even while uh, tourists should be allowed, it's still sometimes also, I think, a financial risk or economic, an economic risk more for a country like how you saw in COVID. Uh, most of the challenges that uh, businesses faced when COVID-19 was there has been a challenge and is still a challenge for those that have been grappling. So I think to avoid um, the economic struggle for some of these uh, businesses like tourism, he would want them to grow and still um, give a lot of input or at least increase into um, the economic side of, of the country, you know? Okay. So it's uh, something that I see could have done with better response mechanisms. Yes, we and even uh, yeah. with the lowest, yeah. Uh, with the 137 cases and, you know, the death toll has now increased to 54 cases. In your opinion, do you think government is uh, taking the outbreak uh, seriously with its new measures in place? Um, I want to believe that they are trying to. However, I think, like I've said, the, the response was a bit delayed. And even for the death, the death toll, uh, at least the numbers speak for themselves, but we need to be able to also question government on how well they're managing the situation on ground, especially given the fact that a lot of health systems or uh, district health systems have not been really uh, adequate enough to have them actually sustain themselves through a pandemic, now through this as Ebola. It's, um, it, there's a need for them to be able to actually show how best they're managing the situation rather than also look at the financial side of it, whether they need more money and how, to, and how they're coming to parliament to request for funds which is not really ideal at such a time, but we need also be able to be given uh, this rights to see that they are being able to put a lot of uh, different mechanisms in place. Aside just telling us the figures, the numbers, we want to be able to know that there is at least a sustainability way to it. If, uh, the, if the risks in uh, managing 
to some of these issues cannot be foreseen, which we understand, they still need to be able to have a plan. They still need to be able to ensure more sustainability to ha how government actually can manage such cases. So I feel like they could have been able to do this still ahead of time, given that we are already having a, a learning experience from COVID. But even given that Ebola has been something that has not truly gone out um, as a country <coughs> that we have suffered from, so they, they should be able to have more uh, to give to us, to show us that they're actually managing the situation better. Let me, let's look at the social, maybe tangent of pandemics. And um, uh, at least you and I, we, we, we are not living in another country, we are living with Ugandans. From the circles you are in, just like COVID, the vigilance of COVID, mm -hmm. do you, in, 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 your, in your observation, do you really see, is, is it the same vigilance that the public is having with Ebola? Uh, in terms of, you know, having a comparative analysis that people are high alert with COVID. In fact, at home, you would never, never enter the house without washing your hands. But with Ebola, I mean, I don't know whether because everyone is so um, tied to making, bringing bread to the table, that is what is on people's mind, people's minds. There seems to be some sort of like cluster vigilance over Ebola. Is, is that true your end? Yes, I think everyone has seen it, at least for the numbers, number of people that have uh, been seen in public over maybe situations, different events and all. It doesn't look like it's something that um, people are taking seriously. For I think maybe for the message that is being preached out uh, by government, it should be really strengthened more to how to manage the numbers, but also how to also uh, ensure that they have a lot in place, even for those that have not been, um, have been found to be sick and have maybe, uh, maybe recovered miraculously, or they have actually had uh, good achievements in it above all, aside the death tolls, they need to actually be able to explain to people, to know and put more restrictions really, because it's still a bit uh, loose to how they are handling it and it could be handled much better. All right, right about now, let me shift the gears because we may, uh, people may think I've brought an, a health expert mm -hmm. <laughs> in, the, in the studio. But uh, Pinya, uh, let us begin from the basics. I wouldn't want to begin, uh, the, you know, the discussion from that. How do countries work out this debt? And how do countries get to accumulate such a colossal amount of debt that this country for... And how even did we even get here? Um, currently for Uganda's debt, especially, um, how we got here, well, you know that Uganda was part of the countries um, that we actually acquired some debt relief. And uh, this was really entitled to the highly, um, highly, the heavily poor countries, indebted poor countries that um, under HIPIC, where Uganda was able to get some debt relief. And uh, given that time of, uh, I think it was 1996, where they actually had promised that they would actually save funds into um, poverty eradication um, area, and a poverty eradication fund, which would enable us to be able to kind of have better ways of uh, improving our social services and also enhancing them so that we could be able to have some uh, kind of uh, plan on how we could work ways on financing our development. So for most of it is that as countries that are indebted, as a country that is indebted, we get to this point when government of course fails to, um, we fail to be able to actually finance our own priorities, our own development priorities or plans. And um, even then, there are so many countries that are indebted. There are those that have borrowed, and we still say that borrowing is not wrong. We believe that every country should be able to actually borrow, but also in your own limits, and also knowing that you have the right financial strategies in place to be able to ensure that you can keep in track of your debt and ensure that it doesn't inflict on the lives of the people or actually cause a lot of economic stress or financial stress. And uh, that is something that we get to see is changing 
as the time goes. Given, of course, at the time when we got our hippic, we we got into the hippic. We got to realize at that time we had a lot of concessional borrowing, which mainly entails um, creditors such as World Bank, IMF, that were giving loans. Uh, with a good grace period. And now it has changed to seeing a lot of non-concessional borrowing where you have creditors like China that have really come into place and have decided to give a lot of money to African countries uh, with a very tight period or a grace period without having them uh, also sustain their debt because most of them have decided to channel it to big projects, infrastructure, just as Uganda has done. And um, this is where it is now ch actually taking a much different uh, toll because you get to realize how we, how we actually pay back is now being constrained because most of the sectors that we are really focusing on have been more on infrastructure and less on the productive sectors. So you get to realize as countries, as a country, we continue to to, re to see that there has been really a much difference between how it was then and now, but also where we are as a country. In today's situation, a lot of, there's been a lot of financial uh, stress and also a lot of impact from the COVID that so many of us are still struggling when it comes to business, as, also, as opposed to also other countries that are also finding it hard to continue borrowing. So they have requested for some debt relief still and of course this discussion is still ongoing to those countries that actually are seeking for debt relief or debt cancellation and um, whether Uganda is actually able to is another case but we would wish that there could be a different direction to how we can handle our debt. But Penina, bring me up to speed with um, the fact that IMF and World Bank can come out and say there could be an impending economic uh, recession and then out, I, 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 I was wondering whether this worked out overnight. And our debt, despite it's not the first time the debt question is in the public, CSOs like Siatini, Uganda Debt Network, have been time and again, you know, thumping and saying our debt is going to be sustainable. It's going to be unsustainable. Stop borrowing maybe put some, some measures, cut the appetite for the money and, and, and all that. But all these calls fell on deaf ears. And now Uganda is having now a record 80 trillion Uganda shillings, which is actually 50% of the national uh, domestic product. How are we going to get out of this? Like, uh, what explains this? Even before you tell us maybe how we are going to get out of this, what explains all this? Who are sleeping on the job? Are these natural macroeconomic turbulences that maybe did not favor us? Or it's some bit of laxity from those that handle our funds, all these borrowed funds? Um, on how well we are managing, especially uh, when it comes to debt management, I believe we could actually do better. Um, given that's how really countries get to this uh, point. Um, as you've said, we hit 80 trillion and uh, already just 47 trillion is external and 30, 33 trillion is domestic debt. So you get to realize that even there has been more increase on the domestic side of borrowing. And uh, of course, that is, going, that is more inflicting on the business person, on the private sector, because there's a lot of crowding out and even while government may choose to borrow domestically, um, it cannot stop to borrow externally as well because, like I've mentioned, the number of loans are now there, um, given that we are now kind of mixing the both, uh, both concessional and non-concessional loans. So you find that countries have been constrained on how best to actually go back to where, where they started. And uh, seeing that we have a lot of also challenges in service delivery, you get to find we are prioritizing debt servicing as a priority when it comes to our national budget. So even for how much interest payment we are having to pay, uh, based off on the loans that we borrow, it really inflicts so much 
on the common person, but also on just the services that can be offered by government. And even for them being basic, the basic services, we still don't see how much more is going to be um, allocated to them, given that we are in this constraint already. We see the allocations to different sectors keep on uh, stagnating. Some have not shifted. Others have been increased, but just really slightly. And uh, that still creates a lot of, um, a lot of uh, you know, stress to think about what it will be like uh, maybe 10 years from now or five years, because we are still failing to actually get to appreciate um, what currently we are going through when it comes to our debt management. All right, uh, maybe you heard it, but right about now, uh, you know, you, Uganda Revenue Authority, you know, came out amidst, you know, this whole economic, uh, you know, uh, crisis says that in this quarter it managed to hit above its target and uh, let's just take a look at what the Commissioner General had to say while unveiling and talking about this uh, monumental achievement of Uganda Revenue Authority in terms of our fiscal policy in uh, in such economic times let's take a look the first quarter of the last financial year. These collections also accounted for 21.54% of the annual target. This is an encouraging sign that the economy is steadily recovering from the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. So it is an opportunity for us as tax collectors uh, to get ready for a higher stretch but also it's an opportunity to rally our partners in this effort, the taxpayers, to even more willingly pay more taxes because we are working towards a higher goal. So as we step up our efficiency, as we step up uh, our transparency, we believe we can borrow less and less until when we win ourselves off borrowing, and as a sovereign state, we will meet our target. As a matter of fact, we have a target annually of growing our tax to GDP as a minimum by 0.5%. But last year, our, GDP, our tax to GDP grew by 1%, and we hope that we can maintain a faster pace so that quickly we can get to 18 or 20% by the year 2025. The high inflation, which has risen from 6.8 in June 2020 to 10% by end of September, has resulted in an increase in the cost of doing business, thus high input costs, which also has significantly reduced the performance of VAT because the input costs were high, therefore reducing the net payable VAT. Mr. Musingo Zirujochi, who is uh, the URA Commissioner General there, you know, trying to bring us up to speed that they managed amidst all the challenges. And one of the economists actually said that we are recovering steadily. Uh, the economy is, is recovering, recovering from the effects of COVID-19. And this is why we are having URA scoring this immensely in this uh, tough time. Uh, Ms. Penina. At this moment in time, these figures, there is there seems to be a mismatch between what you are is collecting and what the working population is feeling in their pockets in this particular time. What causes this mismatch? Because I I, I think it's one economist who reacted uh, on one of the polit uh, talk shows, and he said that URA has managed to score this. Uh, this achievement because people have been paying through the nose these taxes and the same businesses that the same businesses that are paying these taxes are really bleeding and drilling to pay these taxes. Where is that mismatch? Um, the mismatch really is uh, like you've mentioned, a lot of businesses have been uh, challenged during uh, the time of COVID but also you get to realize um, Given the financial stress already, um, the only way government is going to be able to manage a lot of um, this current situation is through collecting more revenue. And you, it may not come to even just uh, you know, big companies or even for the small businesses. They are having to pay every coin that they should, uh, that they are supposed to pay. And even while we usually campaign that uh, you, know, you pay your fair share of tax, 
is that we also want to ensure that, we want to also be able to see that government is actually targeting the right people to pay that tax. Because you find for those that have had to pay uh, double or pay even more, it may not come down to the right to those who are supposed to actually also pay. Because we know so many times there have been leakages, uh, there have been tax incentives, there have been uh, tax exemptions, and still um, some companies have, ma have managed to actually uh, get away without paying some of their money, their tax that they're supposed to pay. So I feel that um, one of the reasons as to why we are really in this p uh, point here is because most of this is really coming down to how um, some of these adjustment measures in during this time is that they need to actually hike the taxation rate, and that's what they're doing. So when they meet a target, it's not that really they, they are seeing the people who have paid, they are really just meeting a target. And that is what we fear, because you get to realize of those that have managed to pay, it doesn't, it doesn't have, um, you find a contribution from the big companies or big, even those that are managed, who should be able to pay more, have not actually been squeezed to that much. It has been mainly the small uh, businesses, you know, the micro, micro businesses, even those that have been managed by the youth or by women that have gotten frustrated. And you get to realize some of those startup businesses uh, may not really even go past five years or even make it to even those five years because they are feeling the pinch of um, every, every coin that they're having to pay. And we find that um, everyone really needs to pay their fair share of tax. But how much of that is actually being paid by a number of the different uh, companies that we get to realize, get tax exemptions or incentives uh, from government. So I feel those are actually leakages that we don't get to incorporate in some of these discussions. And uh, even then, when we even put that into on the table, you get to realize we still haven't found better ways of managing them, or even sustainable ways of, of, of making sure that these uh, leakages are plugged and avoid any loss or revenue loss, or even avoid um, the common person from feeling the, pre the, the pinch of having to pay their tax. As an economist, I would like to borrow from what the, you know, the commissioner is saying. And uh, he, he says that with time, we are going, as a sovereign state, we are going to, because of tax to GDP, we will run, we will be able to get out of debt. Do you think it is really logical that we can tax ourselves out of debt? Of course, given that um, our debt servicing is really coming from our revenues, it is actually one of the things that is building up the pressure. The more we borrow and the more loans that we take on that have um, a high interest payment rate, but also um, do not have any return in investment, you get to realize how we prioritize that does matter. And even then, we get to have more of this debt through that, uh, through more borrowing. And uh, of course, it will inflict the revenue that we collect because you'll find that out of that, we're having to spend over 40% on debt servicing. And it still puts pressure on, on us to actually you know, collect more revenue. Um, there should be other options to how government can finance, uh, different strategies that should be in place, which I'm sure that they have, they're actually thinking of doing, but um, they need to act fast because um, most of this will come from a lot of different um, sectors or even the private sector feeling, getting frustrated of doing business. And you'll find some, some of these companies will actually pull out and will choose to go and do business elsewhere. Others will tend to go into a number of different uh, illegal ways of actually keeping their own profits for themselves. And that will actually make the situation worse as a country. We, our GDP will not be able to grow or be so stable. And that is one of the challenges that we're seeing with some of the countries that have had to um, declare, uh, you know, that they actually are heavily indebted and they have no money to sustain them. So you get to find that this is something that we get to worry over because our tax to GDP is something that even while we, can, we will say we can uh, kind of uh, focus on it, it will be something that will be constrained with the more financial stress that we get to see in this time. Talk about debt servicing. I, I hope I'm correct that debt servicing is not like debt payment. I hope I'm mm. like you, 
I, I mean, when you're servicing debt, it's like maybe you're paying, um, I, I bet to be corrected, that you're paying interest. You're not actually paying the principal mm. of the, the money. You're only, you're servicing, only you're paying interest. Not, you're not actually tackling the real money that was given to you. Mm. Could I be right? It's, it's almost that way. But you see, the bit of uh, debt servicing is that you do pay the interest. But also the more how we refinance our debt is that once it reaches, once we're trying to target a mature, the time it tends to mature, we want that money goes back into servicing our debt or it's supposed to go into that servicing the debt as well. And you get to realize we pay the interest, but also the principal will also eventually have to be um, incorporated within. So it's mainly the interest payment that we are looking at. Okay. Um, in your observation, do you think our debt has been growing in tandem with uh, economic growth generally across board? That we borrow knowing that we have the capacity, we have the projection that we have the capacity at the se balancing with a kind of debt. Because personally, I would go for a loan knowing that I have income that will be, for instance, a salary loan. You know you, you have a job. So when you get this loan, obviously, I mean, the TV I'm working for will slash and, you know, pay the debt. Mm. Has our debt been growing in tandem with, our, with, our, with the economic growth of the country? Um, the debt, our debt itself has, um, of course, gotten a bit of challenges. When it comes to how you have already mentioned earlier, that uh, debt to GDP, is the 50 percent you know that threshold alone which we have surpassed as a country is still one of the issues one of the areas that we target to see that we actually um, ensuring that we're managing our debt and when you tend to borrow more it kind of of course puts a pressure on how fast the economy can, can grow so we tend to see a difference or um, a huge gap in how we now we see the economy is growing. So we have not really seen a balance. It's very hard to get a balance in even a number of different countries. Even the, those that are the richest have been heavily indebted. I'm sure you know. So mm -hmm, even sure. for them, they get to find it's hard to really balance the two because the more resources you pull out to pay uh, most of these loans, it's actually what pulls out a lot of um, constraints, constraints a lot of the borrow, a lot of the constraints a lot of the in, the in the, a lot of the economy that is actually supposed to be put into the economy. You end up having to, um, you know, burden the people because they have to pay more taxes, they have to look for better ways of, uh, of managing their income because even that will be taxed and even then they won't be able to have sustainable ways of living. And already you get to find that is not something that you're seeing today. You're getting to find a different picture, which doesn't show a balance of what we see as the economy growing. So it tends to, we tend to find that there's a much bigger gap that we should uh, be able to ask really government on how well we can actually see to it that we can balance the two and whether it is actually possible that we can actually get out of a debt trap before it becomes a, a debt trap or even be before it becomes an issue that we may not be able to actually be able to do it because most of our money that we have borrowed is actually going to constrain out of the f more of the future generation and that is you and me sure um yeah. on that on that point i will i, I once was you know going on a you know boda boda and this boda boda rider you know how boda boda you know tax can have lot of you know jazz a, a lot of conversations so he triggered a conversation and he told me in Luganda in the Luganda dialect and he's like do you know that our country is so indebted I wonder where he got this information that to the extent that if we are to pay the current debt that we have he didn't I think have the figures maybe mm -hmm. but I think he was just being hypothetical about what he had on radio and said that the, the presenter who was saying all this he mentioned actually the name that if we are to pay to the last coin, even a newborn baby has to pay almost 1.7 million to clear this whole day. How, how true, how true is that? Oh, that is more hypothetical. If 
if it were the case. Of course, uh, given the fact that when you borrow, you're really, if we borrow in a sense that is not um, going to be a financial challenge uh, to those, uh, the generation to come, is something that you can find that is going to be sustainable, where we can manage our spending, our borrowing, all that entails how we actually do the debt management. But then if we tend to also borrow without uh, uh, a lot of strategies in place on how we can be able to manage our debt, you get to find that the future generation is actually going to be impacted. And it's not because that um, for each, it's not because that for the services that we have failed to get, we have to pay through our nose. It's not, it's because that we have decided to prioritize uh, servicing our debt more than opposed to putting more of the resources into a lot of these uh, service delivery areas. So you get to find any citizen, me and you, whether it is um, uh, children to come or even the generation to come, will have to still find a way to pay back this debt. And that is what will come into place if we do not find a way of managing the debt well today. Because if we choose to ignore all the different things that we are seeing, on how uh, badly we are doing when it comes to um, actually even surpassing the 50% threshold is really one of them, but also how well we are failing to actually balance how our economy is striving and struggling at the same time in uh, being able to meet a lot of the different priorities or needs of the people. So you find that we will have to actually contribute to that. We actually already, I believe, are contributing through the taxes we pay through a number of the different uh, areas that we have seen, we have had to kind of focus on as a country, as opposed to meeting a number of the different development uh, plans and needs that we have to for the people of the country. Well, uh, you really ex uh, explain it uh, so well, but do you think government really sees this? It's not that we I mean, government does not have those programs. So many, I, I, I keep referring to the position paper by Siatini on the national budget framework paper, I think of the last financial year. And you pointed out uh, a priority in key areas that were more productive than consumptive mm. in, that, in that. Is it that government doesn't know what to do? Or maybe they just don't get it? Um, it's not that, I believe that they do know. They have the capacity, I believe, uh, to do what they, they're supposed to do. However, uh, when it comes to how we may look at priorities, uh, given that we know there have been a number of different years from maybe 2014-15 when we decided to focus on infrastructure, a lot of uh, different projects were taken on. Uh, even for energy or when it came to the dams and uh, Isimba and Karoma, we, we, you got to realize a shift in how our government was going to prioritize and it has still continued. And their basic reasoning is that they, they actually believe that with time we can actually be able to re get this return in investment. But you get to find a number of these projects have, been, have had some challenges, um, some on absorption, issues. Some have been also been uh, uh, seen to actually f fail to actually even contribute to having some return on investment to the economy. And you find uh, even while they may have a focus on productive sectors, we believe that there is more need to specialize in actually um, focusing on some of these key sectors like agriculture, trade, those that you actually find will have a better, more um, higher return in investment. So it's not that, uh, probably it's what they thought would work as opposed to the latter, but then you get to realize also we need to do better when it comes to budgeting, planning, how we foresee the country where it's going is what we need to come back to re-strategize in key sectors that would be able to do really much more uh, productivity for the country and contribute highly on the GDP side it's important that we can actually focus on them as well and still build another side of also contributing on to a number of these different projects, but seeing those that are working and those that aren't and actually replace them with those that should be able to provide that productivity that we need to be able to have more return in investment. Well, 
talking about government planning, I think right about now uh, you would react uh, to this, but uh, the state minister for finance, you know, came out to justify the borrowing of 1.7 uh, trillion shillings for infrastructure. In, uh, amidst this uh, whole impending economic crisis, uh, still the minister storms parliament to justify that they need more money even when they have been, actually not, this is only even one, there, are, there have been so many supplementary budgets coming in. But let's take a look at why the state minister justified this loan. By the way, it was approved by parliament to be able to uh, finance infrastructure. Let's take a look. To finance the 2022-2023 budget, parliament approved the external borrowing of shillings, 12.5 trillion. Currently, government is seeking an urgent parliament approval of 1.7 trillion shillings loan to finance the country's development and infrastructure budget for the current financial year. The only request before this committee is the request to borrow up to euros 455.03 million, an equivalent of United States dollars 464.13 from Stanley Chartered Bank, who is arranging financing from other financial institutions to finance the development and infrastructure budget for financial year 2022-2023. However, lawmakers on the Parliament's Committee on National Economy tasked the State Minister for Finance in charge of general duties, Henry Musasi, to give a distinctive accountability of the loan request, and the Minister failed to do so. Parliament needs to satisfy itself that all due processes have been followed and all authorizations have been got. I have mentioned that cabinet chaired by the president sat and considered this loan request and authorized me to come to parliament to seek for approval. Mind you, we are doing this on behalf of all Ugandans. If we borrow wrongly, we are affecting our children and grandchildren. So we are here representing the entire country was referred to the committee. It did not pass through the House. It was referred to the committee through the business committee, not through the main house, parliament, to this house, number one. Number two, this loan was discussed here on Monday, and then it was brought to parliament on Tuesday, working on reverse order. What are the development projects that are going to be funded with this particular loan? Musasizi tabled the request before the committee on October 31st. However, MPs on the committee were not satisfied by his explanation on expenditure and accountability. The loan request, if approved, Standard Chartered Bank will be the agent for Standard Chartered Bank United Kingdom, which emerged as the best bidder and the Kuwait Fund. I repeat this parliament with the request to be approved in a matter of days of 1.7 trillion. But they've just spent. 1.7 trillion in a supplementary schedule one. You go through some of the items, then you know the crisis this country is in and why we need to act boldly and decisively at the institution of parliament. Because at the end of the day, we are the only firewall between the Bank of Uganda and the government that is stepping out of hand in terms of accumulating our national debt. Of the 48.1 trillion shillings budget for this financial year 2022-2023, the government only released 10.25 trillion in the first quarter and 7.3 trillion in the second quarter. Sarah Nakandi, CTV, PM Edition. Now, that is the Minister of State for Finance and Economic Planning, you know, trying to explain and justify why we need to borrow 1.7 trillion shillings and yet earlier on they had approved another loan of 1.7 trillion the same amount and parliament in one way or the other also trying to feel i think it's feeling the heat on you know what other priorities in this time when we need uh, some bit of frugality and austerity in terms of where our public funds are going well Madam Pina, what is, what is your reaction to that? Because are we caught, is government or the country caught between 
a, hard, a rock and a hard place in terms of how do we, what do we borrow and what should we borrow it for? In what, in, you really feel, look at the legislators, the way they were reacting. There is some sense of frustration in, in one way or the other. What, what is your take? And what would you advise, by the way? Yes. Um, well, of course, given the fact that uh, Parliament is in that uh, position to approve loans, uh, definitely they have, ha they have seen uh, government come in and uh, request for more. And it's not that even that we are really uh, requesting on uh, resources that we have, we are borrowing to be able to finance a number of different areas. Um, those that they couldn't mention, but you find even for, it puts Parliament in a more harder place, especially given their role, but also um, we know that they are supposed to be able to have an oversight um, role in this uh, kind of, uh, in the approval of the loans. And you find most of the time uh, these loans are rushed and have been had to, to really be approved within a short period of time. So I feel that they are also having challenges with how much they're actually approving versus what is actually coming out and being declared as properly utilized or maybe accountability has been actually okay. So they get to find challenges still with how government is going about doing things. And even then, the number of supplementary budgets that are coming in uh, during such a time is worrying because you find that even while we may have um, issues to do with spending, we are still having challenges when it comes to our fiscal discipline and also how much we are able to borrow, knowing, that how, knowing how much we should be able to spend. Uh, that alone has now passed because we are borrowing now to spend or to pay for a lot of the different, even on a, for a budget really, to finance a national budget. And that is really something that is, is, is actually challenging. So I believe as a parliament, but also even as citizens of Uganda really, there is need for us to take caution and be able to actually understand some of these issues when it comes to debt, but also for parliament to be able to take on um, its rightful role of having to scrutinize and actually ask government for uh, more accountability, even for those that they have approved really, to see how the process is moving. Because you get to realize there's a challenge to how uh, reporting on debt is. You get to find that we can only see um, so far what we have already borrowed for, maybe in 2021, as opposed to how we can see for 2022. What exa how exactly resources are being utilized may not come out until next year to know whether this loan was properly utilized and how it was actually used. Um, so it, it's a big challenge really on how we can follow up on this. And uh, Parliament's role really should be able to monitor effectively, but also for us as a civil society to be able to engage in such processes. And we feel that that has been left really closed door. You find uh, most of these discussions have not been really open to the public and you get to realize most of that is falling on, falling on the shoulders of Parliament to be able to act and serve the people without having to also put us in a difficult position, yeah, maybe 10 or 5 years from now, where we may not be able to, to be able to account for what we have been uh, borrowing for, and it can actually come back to haunt us. Now, recently, I think you will uh, maybe bring me up to speed, but we have seen a shift in budgeting, whereby now uh, government has opted for program-based budgeting. Um, I would think shifting to the program-based budgeting was to be able to finance programs that would be productive and maybe increase uh, maybe household income and maybe the GDP and also maybe our GNI. Uh, but we still grapple with funds that are borrowed and they are not whereby the absorption of the debt we borrow in terms of utilizing this for programs can sit on accounts for days and then it returns to the consolidated fund without achieving its intended purpose and yet we still have to service this loan. Where could the problem be? 
Mm, I think, of course, the program-based budgeting was is an approach that is something that we really uh, were, were welcome to seeing because we wanted uh, government to actually focus more of its allocations to specific uh, key areas with outputs, of course, outcomes that they could be able to fall back and ask for accountability on and be able to track properly. Um, of course, uh, given that um, most of the times you found uh, we have, there have been challenges where government has not been able to see or has been having challenges on meeting its targets. And uh, that is something that may come from also how we have chosen where to place the money. Um, on what we see that is really key versus what we see, or versus what we see is a priority, and what, is, what, what we see is a non-priority. So you get to find a lot of unfunded uh, priorities are continuing to reoccur, coming to each financial year without more money being put to them. And because this has been really, as we have seen, more focus has been put into uh, different sectors, uh, such as infrastructure, and uh, you get to find some sectors such as education and agricultural health are still swind are still uh, lacking in terms of how best they can actually reap uh, big from a number of the different allocations they receive every year. So I find that, of course, borrowing to spend and actually maybe look at how best to utilize this money is still a challenge. You get to find absorption challenges have really skyro skyrocketed in given the period the over the period that uh, some of this uh, uh, budgeting has gone through especially in times when you find supplementaries have also been uh, more of a priority more of spending uh, government spending has increased versus to how well they are trying to also see how uh, well they can manage um, um, allocation and proper utilization of this money so you find most of the time we're having to grapple with how best we are seeing the results versus the reality, of course, on ground, that so many are seeing a challenge of how best they're actually seeing services being delivered to them, to the actual people that are intent should be delivered to, but also how best we are utilizing this money. It's getting into a challenge of where we now need to ask government to be able to have proper accountability mechanisms in place to ensure that we can be able to actually track or even be able to even be given that information to know that how well we are doing when it comes to utilization of the money. So absorption challenges really, and even for the Auditor General has mentioned a number of times in his reports how much uh, absorption is still an issue and what really best that they should do, but we find some of those recommendations have not really been at least taken on to see how well to address the issue. All right. Uh, well, you are watching the big debate. It is just four minutes to the top of the hour of 11. Uh, right about now, we take a break, but we are talking matters date here on the big debate. Uh, let's just take a quick commercial break. The big debate continues. Stay tuned. Mayor Prey of there and Uganda Queens Midifruda and Bypass Sports Club. I started in the village where I come from. I come from Tsolo, I'm from Bida. I started from Tsolo, Young Simba. I prayed for Young Simba and Halambe Soka Academy. He will go for a shot! That the ball from the best player! Bobo Sibiruhaka! They see me on TV, they feel happy to play for the national team. Just out of football, I like chilling with my friends, even like watching basketball, because me, I love basketball, and I'm a fan of City Oilers in Uganda. Nirvana Packaged Drinking Water is a product of Crown Beverages Limited, makers of Pepsi products. That's life. That's Nirvana.
Recharge your day with Sting. Extreme Energy. Refreshing test. Available countrywide. Sting. Life switched on. From the makers of Pepsi. Sometimes in life, we spend all the time trying to live other people's life. And along the way, we lose who we are by coping what other people are doing in their relationship. Now you see, from the last time I met your sister, I've not spent a day or a minute without thinking about her. It's a good surprise on a Monday. <laughs> This is nice. So you and him are hmm? we're just friends. Wow. Come on. <laughs> just friends. You either tell me where you're from or you go back to where you've been. Thinking it would work out for us, but yet to find out. That's not who we are after experiencing a great disappointment. She's in love with some other man, so classy, a gentleman. Not what that was like here. These are the mistakes girls do. Now showing on CTV. Don't blink. We're glad you're still tuned in to CTV History and Munanera here. It is the big debate. And we're talking matters, uh, economics matters to do with the public debt. Well, we would like to shift the discussion to a lot of incessant supplementary budgets that are coming in right about, right about now in Parliament from government at a time when I believe uh, government should be you know, doing more of austerity and frugality in terms of knowing and understanding the economic times we are living in. Well, in Parliament, there was so much, you know, awash with Mwanga Chivumbi, the Shadow Minister for Finance, coming out to castigate and try to delay and stop the approval of some of these budgets after a big chunk of loans has been given to government, and this is what he had to say. Let's just take a look. Right, Honorable Speaker, this is blackmail of this parliament. They have just spent under 3%, 1.4 trillion in supplementary expenditure. And the minister, where this is honest, where have they spent the money? 89 billion given to Sudir to build a marina. They've just given 127 billion to Atiak. They've just spent 800 of our money on defense expenditure. They've just spent part of that money, 135 billion on classified expenditure at the State House. So there is no scarcity of resources. There is wrong appropriation of the needs of the country. To say there is a crisis of liquidity in the country, they've just told us. URA has performed its target by 200 billion in this quarter. Therefore, that is not to be done. That's not the argument that they can fly and create an artificial crisis for wrongly first expending money on wrong things. Then they leave the fundamental and come to parliament and blackmail and stampede this parliament. It is high time we stopped this blackmail by making a very solid resolution to reject it. Right, Honorable Speaker, the other issue at hand a very critical right honorable speaker this loan as it is worldwide there is no loan in the world today where 10 percent of the loan goes to an insurance we all borrow money we all pay insurance on our small loans the loan fee is normally for insurance around between 1 and 2 percent. It can't be 10 percent of the loan. And, and right honorable speaker, for, from my perspective, where I stand, this is a poor deal, wrongly negotiated. The firewall to stop this lies with this parliament. We must raise the courage, the strength of character to speak true to power, including the executive, and tell them enough is enough. 
Uh, passions flaring there uh, from the Member of Parliament for Butambala, uh, Honorable Muanga Chivumbi, you know, saying that we should stop this broad day light robbery. But, you know, on the other, on the flip side of the coin, I think he lost his battle because that loan was approved. And uh, Ms. Penina, what is your reaction? Do you think if you are the legislator, you would react in that way, knowing that government has, in these times when government seems to, needs to be frugal, we time and again we are seeing supplementary budgets in parliament being approved, but also on the tail end there is no clear accountability. Do you think government seems to be shooting fast and aiming late? Um, given, of course, uh, like the position the legislature is in uh, parliament, you get to realize that a lot of pressure or when it comes to approving these loans is really, and even these budgets, um, has really put them in a place where it is hard to account to the people. And even then, even us as the people, as the citizens, are also getting frustrated with how much we're having to pay, you know. So even for while um, the reasons as to why uh, government may choose to uh, take on a lot of supplementary budgets, and I believe this is even having a challenge on our, on our laws and policies, like the PFMA Act, on what it stipulates as the maximum or minimum percentage that a government should be taking on for supplementary budgets. We see that this is actually going beyond. We are breaking a number of uh, the laws that we put in place because of our spending. And also the fiscal discipline is not there. We get to realize most of the time that uh, more of these fiscal supple these supplementary budgets keep on recurring. We find it's putting us in a difficult position every day. And you find also there's less of accountability, like you mentioned, when it comes to these supplementaries. Because by the time we can have a national budget um, planned for the whole year, and we still find ways of adding supplementaries. This means we're not actually planning well. We're not actually um, ensuring that we are sticking to the right uh, proper, you know, fiscal discipline that we should be, be able to follow. So we're having to look at different alternatives of getting money, uh, different ways of government financing, um, a number of these different uh, non-priorities, and some of them like you've had more on security, um, more on payment of individuals on how on on for their businesses, which is actually failing to have us actually appreciate why we actually should be able to um, borrow more or even spend more on some of these things. So you find there's no need for us to even have a national budget at times because we get to see government has gone past um, some of these uh, limits in how how they've been able to uh, finance a lot of the priorities and also finance some of those that they shouldn't be financing in given the situation right now. But uh, I want you to react maybe to this as well, maybe just, just your take. Um, do we see, I think one, one economist once said that Uganda is over-governed, that's number one, that we have more, we have more leaders eating into the funds because every other time a district is being uh, created, a constituency is being uh, created, and also this is having, whereby now we have reached a point where government even has to borrow to pay a loan, whereby it's like, I can't borrow from you, I, 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 you, you lend me money to go pay a credit. So how, how is this even tenable? Isn't that even showing that we, uh, government seems to be you know, punching a square peg in a round hole? Um, of course, uh, having to borrow to pay or to actually pay a loan is um, something that we see that is, uh, it starts small, but you get to realize the more we actually take chances on doing that uh, more recurrently, you get to find um, most of the issues we have with uh, money or even how utilize is done is going to be uh, much more of a challenge uh, to us as a country but even also how we choose to budget and plan will be something that we want to take seriously 
um, for the times that we have focused on in enhancing, uh, for government to enhance um, its national budget process, uh, even for people to, citizens to understand or take initiative in knowing wh what, is in, what is it in for them when it comes to know your budget, or even take into consideration the different priorities that uh, government is trying to meet and find a way into, for citizens to find a way into the process by uh, participating and being really engaging in these, in these areas. We get to find that uh, this may be something that will actually um, tackle it down because most of it is actually going to get uh, most of the citizens frustrated. But also from aside that, you get to find um, the credibility we shall have on our budget even will be something that we may not focus on. And uh, credibility alone, if left out, can really make it very hard for us to be appreciative of what other things we would be able to see come into place. And also for the times that we have uh, focused on how best to do the budget, how best to do the budget process, we did find more and more uh, citizens have also found a way of asking for accountability from their leaders. You know, asking your member of parliament what exactly they're doing uh, at parliament, whether they're actually uh, being able to echo your needs or priorities this financial year. So it's really a hard one, basing off on um, how best we want uh, government to actually improve in uh, citizen engagement and participation, but also for citizens to be aware and actually take on uh, their rightful role or their rights in engaging in a number of these, these, these different processes. So I find it uh, uh, really going to be challenging on how best we can see uh, some of these things bear fruit over a period of time because we get to realize there will be a, a lot of laxity in accountability. Um, transparency will definitely have its issues, but more so credibility into the national budget process is something that will be a struggle for citizens to appreciate. Someone once told me that uh uh, austerity may not be the right <laughs> word. Do you think we are at a point now where austerity should be the way to go for government, whereby they are cutting expenses here and trying to shield here in order for this uh, particular sector where they are to be able to cover for that? Do you think government has reached that point? Or just as the Bank of Uganda report says, you know, the fundamentals of the economy are still strong we can still support our debt, we can still sustain our debt, or maybe they are maybe glossing over a glaring uh, time bomb economically. Um, I believe, of course, if we, if we found uh, at least um, those frugal ways of spending money were in place. Um, I remember at least for the time during uh, COVID, there were a lot of different measures that were taken on um, to how government was spending. And you get to realize, you know, workshops or, you know, number of workshops that were being done or planned for had been cut, um, travel had been reduced. Such things, such measures actually enabled it easier for uh, government to be able to actually um, have more in place when it came to accountability and also how it spent the money that was there because we didn't know what tomorrow was going to come with. So it's good that we should we should find a way to have government actually be frugal. Austerity, I'm not sure really how best to f f kind of phrase it to that point. But of course, ensuring that we have commitment um, from government on how best they can actually spend and utilize as well as accountability. Because you find even for now the loans that we're taking on, we get to find um, different creditors are putting now a lot of limits or a lot of had conditionalities on the money that they are giving to government. So it's not all uh, fair in all books because you find even if we do not, if we do, not do the, the frugal, the cutting down on our spending, you get to realize even for the money that we'll be borrowing, even the creditors will get tired of, of having to uh, lend more money without having proper, account, proper ways of actually seeing what it has done for us. But also basing on the fact that we need to be able to actually see that even the lenders are able to, you know, lend to a country responsive, like have responsible uh, lending 
to a country because usually we target how well we're doing when we come to borrowing uh, but we have to also ensure that um, our lenders are actually also, also able to put kind of constraints to how well at least government should be able to manage the money that they borrow to see to it that they have more accountability mechanisms in place before they borrow the money how best they're going to actually have inclusivity of the people of the citizens to be able to actually take into uh, full appreciation of some of this uh, money that they do borrow and wh whether it will actually go into full utilization and uh, proper absorption so i feel it's actually good if some of these things come as conditionalities but also we have to not wait for that time we have to be able to actually be able to have proper uh, mechanisms in place adjustment mechanisms in place that can actually fit the given situation that we're in rather than wait for it to get worse yes um, you know um as, as a prospective lawyer you know there is there is a saying in law that says he who seeks equity must come with clean hands yeah. but now that government is in this uh, in this in this i would call it uh, economic malaise we see actually we, we have brilliant ideas on this show about what they should do but the fountain of honor who sits in state house in this January, the office of the president or state house asked for a tune of 4.7 billion. He did not, it, that did not, parliament itself, that's in supplementary, and then parliament itself came with 3.8 trillion in just as in this, in this financial. What does this, does this speak? Is government hearing what Siatini tells it? I mean, every other, every other day on debt on you have done very brilliant you know papers and policy statements you have i must say you must even how you meet even the technocrats that are the helm of policy making are you being hard um of course there's only so much that we can be able to advocate for when it comes to our role as a civil society organization but even not doing it alone, we have done a number of different collaborations and partnered with different CSOs to engage in a number of these different processes. Um, how we choose to be able to see to it that we keep on tracking and monitoring uh, government is that we hope that with a number of different proposals that we do place uh, annually, we get to find that at least they should be able to take on a number of, you know, the different side to it and how we are able to also contribute to the process. But um, of course, government spending vis-a-vis -vis, um, how the growth, the economy is growing is something that is very challenging. We get to find, of course, such supplementaries or even such huge amounts of money have actually stif stifled the growth of a number of different sectors. So you get to find, even while these have been prioritized, vis-a-vis -vis, um, the sectors that should be actually be revived, such as uh, trade or agriculture, you find most of these are not going to be able to actually bring any return in investment or even have more um, productivity in a sense. So it's uh, challenging, of course, when we get to find uh, some of these are still recurring, but we want to be able to still hold government accountable we still want to see that there's a lot of transparency in how they do these things, but also in absorption. How best to actually know that we can find ways of actually holding them accountable with areas of evidence, but also knowing that we need to change the way they do a number of these things. Supplementary budgets, for one, is something that we have always talked about that is really against uh, the fiscal discipline of things, but also how we tend to run the economy it definitely stifles it and makes it a challenge. Um, I, uh, let me put some bit of uh, conspiracy theory in this. Um, I, I would want to be, I don't know, I, I want to be convinced in a way, to convince myself, that maybe Uganda is not where we are maybe entirely because of our own doing. Uh, reading a book by uh, John Perkins, The Confessions of like, an Economic Hitman, I don't know if you've read it, uh, where he says, uh, these bridge on woods institutions that is world bank imf and him being part of that whole uh, that whole cabal were going into countries and literally convincing them to get into debt pile a lot of debt do these humongous infrastructure uh, you know uh, projects but then couldn't but well knowing that they couldn't pay these debts 
So, what is, do, do you really think that most of the countries are really in debt because they really had to be in debt? Or we are someone, there is an invisible hand that is running this thing and they are benefiting. Many people are becoming rich. Countries are becoming richer, richer and organizations are becoming richer out of uh, the disadvantaged position some of these nations find themselves in. Um, well, uh, given the fact that we have seen, like you've mentioned, uh, there have been different areas, different traps. It's actually like how you can find uh, countries have had to uh, depend on borrowing to sustain a lot of their fina financing needs, but also to ensure that they can be able to keep afloat. And um, even then, we feel, at least we feel that most of the time, when we choose to go that route, there needs to be a way we can actually sustain our financing. And that's why it's very important to have uh, domestic revenue that we can actually back on. When we have a number of different areas where we can actually target to um, collect revenue, rather than have to rely on borrowing. And that is what we try to uh, emphasize at Siatini, that there is need to actually ensure that we can enhance domestic revenue as opposed to having to borrow more. Um, whether this is something that can be able to uh, bridge the gap on how much we have already borrowed, it's something that we believe can actually uh, limit the pressure or actually even the strain of how much we're having to pay back into debt servicing. So you find most countries actually have very, un very much untapped revenue, um, even when it comes to a number of different sectors, extractives, I, I'm sure you've seen those that have been able to pull in more revenue than they had planned, but also for different areas that uh, have also been uh, offering a lot of production into the country, like trade, um, enhancing these areas and balancing how best we import and export will definitely help us actually engage, but also you know close the gap on how much we are losing out, how much money is actually being lost uh, to some of these leakages, um, like you know, the illicit financial flows and uh, tax incentives and exemptions that we keep seeing recurring, there would be a better deal in actually ensuring that we strategize on domestic revenue mobilization and strengthen that arm more to avoid us from actually having to borrow and pile on more debts that we may not be able to actually be able to uh, finance ourselves. Okay, um, actually, we are coming right to the end of the show, but. Uh, as you're making your final remarks, uh, just a quick one. The deputy governor of Bank of Uganda, you know, projected and said the economic as is now is likely to get better according to the economic forecast of Bank of Uganda 2025, 20, uh, 2026. Uh, what is, as what are your projections? Are we, are we here to stay? in this or we just need to before it gets better it's going to get worse um definitely if, uh, once we can be able to actually project um as a country where we're going we hope that that's where we actually intend to go um of course sometimes you've seen different projections um there have been projections to how well we, we may be going but then you find you're actually going off road and uh at Siatini, we, we believe that we can actually do better um, when it comes to how government can actually make, make different strategies that can actually meet uh, some of those projections. Because you find without proper planning or even budgeting, budgeting or taking into stock um, a number of different untapped areas or revenue, like I mentioned, you get to find some of these uh, projections can be really um, not feasible. Uh, because you'll find there will be a lot of uh, financial pressure, there will be a lot of constraints on how well to um, create money or actually even have more, um, you know, financing, um, financing uh, gaps uh, at least to be addressed. But you get to realize most of this is going to be harder to meet when we do not have the right strategies in place. And therefore such projections can actually be misleading when it comes to how best we tend to have what is on ground today. The reality of what we see is what is important today. 
rather than us having to foresee something that at the back of it we know today it's not what we actually we actually plan we all we actually can see going forward as something promising so we need uh, for government to be able to actually instead also plan for better uh, put in line the right mechanisms or strategies in place that can ensure us to foresee that well or project in times of uh, such as these that it's very hard for us to actually uh, be able to actually appreciate some of those things so we need to be able to have them uh, kind of put a whole a, a tight uh, mark on it on how best we do our planning today yes uh, as uh, you're parting shots tonight what are recommendations uh, maybe quickly what should government do what should be done so that we you know get out of this gutter we find ourselves in um, our recommendations have been that, of course, as I mentioned, um, one, we need to exhaust our revenue, uh, more on seeing the untapped revenue uh, that we can be able to collect. We believe that uh, government would be actually doing better if they could uh, actually engage on some of these different gaps that we are seeing um, that would be able to actually put at, at least some bit of uh, promising figures to how well we're actually managing today. Um, but also we want to see more emphasis put on productive sectors uh, that can bring in more, uh, you know, um, income or more revenue, but more in strengthening at least, especially uh, the livelihoods of people. Because if you do not have the citizens taken care of or even stable, you get to find that death doesn't only hinder uh, a nation, but also goes down to households households and also how well they're able to sustain themselves. So we want to ensure that, we want to at least recommend to government to ensure that they also balance the equation uh, by having more allocation to productive sectors like trade, agriculture, but also keeping in mind that we need to be able to have a better way of managing our debt, um, ensuring that the role of parliament is something that is taken seriously and not something that is just seen to be something that they have to go through uh, to get what they need or to get the money that they need. The, um, we believe that they were put in that place for a reason and given the power that they should, on behalf of the people, be able to actually um, have their way in scrutiny and, overs and their oversight role and how they be able to actually see proper absorption and utilization of the money that is being borrowed. That, those are just a few of the recommendations. Thank you so much, Ms. Penny Nambawazi, for sparing time from seeing to come and sharing with our viewers on matters uh, public debt. Well, that brings us to the end of the big debate tonight. But a quick one from me, that in the current times, we are supposed to survive, not to thrive. Let us survive, not to thrive. Well, it has been the big debate. We've been discussing the uh, public debt and how sustainable that Uganda's debt seems to be in these current uh, economic times. Well, I'd like to say bye-bye for now. I've been Heston Munanra. See you next week on another interesting edition of the big debate. Have a good night.